All right, I've got top of the hour. Good morning to everybody across the United States and anyone joining us internationally. Good day. I'm happy to have you with us for our third week of our 2019 summer boot camp. Today's topic is going to be on fleet management. The layout of what we're going to do today. Uh, we'll go over a brief introduction. I want to talk to you about our core objective for today. Um, a little background for emergency or on emergency reporting. Uh, because we do have not only customers, but we also have um, people looking at um, going to another RMS, potential customers that are joining us as well. A uh, quick rundown of our system features, and then we're going to get into not occupancy inspections. That was last week. Should have changed that slide. It will be on fleet management, um, and that's the, uh, the boot camp, the core of our boot camp and push-ups for our brain today. That's me, Tom Lewis. I'm the business development analyst, um, a business development analyst with emergency reporting. Uh, been with emergency reporting since 2011 as a part-time trainer. Then upon retiring from my fire department in Southern Arizona, after 22 years of service, I uh, became a full-time uh, trainer regionally, then Department of Defense and International, and have now moved into the business development analyst position supporting our sales team as a subject matter expert. And uh, I'm very happy to be with all of you today. So today's objective, to provide an effective, easy to use solution that answers this key question. How can I improve the overall management of my vehicle fleet while also adhering to NFPA 1900. Those of you that have joined us um, in previous weeks, um, I like to focus on a core solution um, uh, for an agency while also referencing a particular standard that's out there. And the last two weeks have been NFPA standards. And, and again, we'll follow that tradition again today. Those of you brand new to the emergency reporting family or looking to join the emergency reporting family, I just wanna give you a quick background on who we are. We're based out of Bellingham, Washington. That's our headquarters. Um, our, <clears throat> our entire sales tra and training team are spread throughout the country. Um, I'm coming to you from Tucson, Arizona, where I live. And uh, we serve um, over 460,000 personnel in our system of those well over 165,000 are authorized unique users. In other words, they have a login and a password. Um, not everybody has a login and password because not everybody is granted access to the system depending on the organization. And that's why there's a difference between those two numbers. We serve at over 6,600 departments worldwide. Um, we follow the agile software development process. In other words, we're constantly releasing a new iteration of emergency reporting every two weeks. If anywhere from new features, to bug fixes, to system enhancements, that's ongoing. So software is never finished. And you probably know that by the, if, uh, by the constant updates you have on your, uh, your smartphones. Um, many of those companies, they also follow the Agile process. And that's why you usually see a surge in app updates um, on a weekly or biweekly basis. Um, our uptime and reliability is, is rock solid. Um, we're up 99.99% of the time. And to give you perspective, we'll drop, a, we'll drop one of those nines. If we were down to just 99.9%, that means out of the entire year, 8,760 hours, we would be down no more than eight hours. And I can tell you, we're not even down anywhere close to that. And that's counting the 24 hour clock, 365 days a year. We have a 24 seven support for priority one tickets, priority two and priority three follow our service level agreements with uh, very quick responses from our uh, top notch support team. And those of you that are not with emergency reporting, um, you do need to know that our support team is also based in Bellingham, Washington. Um, they are experts in the system and, they, and you will be able to understand them. And it's uh, a key part of how we deliver service to our customers. Uh, we support compliance with a myriad of standards, um, including NFPA 1300, 1500, and of course 1710 and 1720 for volunteer departments. Uh, we currently serve both um, the entire United States Army and the entire United States Marine Corps under a government enterprise contract. And then we also have a robust partner community. When, when I mention partners, I'm talking about uh, scheduling partners like NetDuty and um, other partners like Streetwise and First Do that uh, are part of our 
ecosystem. I hate to even use that term, but they're, we have relationships with these companies and the data is shared uh, between, between us and them to make a better experience for our customers that need to have another solution, say for scheduling or for uh, incident management. 16 modules. Uh, the partner interfaces are, are through our API, um, a solid CAD interface. I, I, I don't think of, I can think of one CAD company that we don't interface with and interface well with. Over 600 system reports, 1710, 1720 analytics, as well as NFPA 1500 analytics. We also have an offline capable app, uh, Inspect ER. Um, that is available for iOS, Android, and Windows, and we're we're putting out some updates to it uh, recently, um, and more to come in the months ahead to improve that overall app. And it's a great app. Um, for, it's designed for tablets and allows you to work offline in the event that during during inspections you have a loss of internet connectivity or have intermittent internet connectivity. Okay, so today's topic: NFPA 1911 is the standard for inspection, maintenance, testing, and retirement of in-service emergency vehicles. So whether or not you, you all realize it or not, it is the foundation for our daily truck checks in managing our fleets. So here's from chapter seven of NFPA 1911. And I just want to show you that they go through in depth anywhere from just daily visual and operational checks to pump testing to aerial uh, device testing. Um, it's a comprehensive document. And the nice thing about it is that even if you're not an NFPA member, you can view it for free. Now you can't download it, you can't print it and all of that, but you can reference it online by going to the NFPA website. And you can see here, this all is gonna look familiar to all of us. All the visual checks, this is essentially a, a condensed truck check form, and that's just the first part of it. It goes down into the 40s on the next page. Um, I just wanted to show you a sample of what is listed in NFPA 1911. And as you're enhancing your fleet management program, this is most definitely a go-to document that you wanna have by your side as you um, improve the overall management of your vehicles and, and uh, it doesn't cover equipment, but of course we know a lot of what we're doing on our truck involves the checking of the equipment too. And we'll, we'll discuss that also today. Um, one other thing, a little housekeeping note, if any issues arise with my audio or video, just send a question via the, the question um, section of your GoToMeeting control panel and um, I'll definitely fix it. We've always been pretty successful in keeping a, a good connection, but if anything occurs or you're having issues, just let me know and we'll do our best to rectify that. Whoops, one slide too, too far ahead. Okay, sorry about that. So even in, in a lot of, especially if you're become assigned to uh, managing or being your go-to operations person for fleet, you want to you want to begin referencing a standard like 1911. If you become the safety officer, your new Bible, so to speak, is going to be NFPA 1500. But the good thing about a lot of these NFPA documents, and this is a lot of um, what we reference too in developing our software, is that they give you examples, and so they even give you a truck check form, a rig check form, here. And so even if you decided you wanted to replicate this one, um, it's easy to do. And what I'm going to show you today in our new rig checks um, tool. And I always learn something new. After 22 years in the fire service, you think you know quite a bit, and, and maybe you do, but there's always something new here. And so I did not know this, and this was asked of me recently. So how long can I keep a truck really in service? And I say, well, I really don't know. You think I've always been told, oh, 20 years is pretty good. But per NFPA 1911, it's recommended that apparatus more than 15 years old that have been properly maintained and that are still in the in-service status uh, be upgraded, uh, be placed in reserve status, be upgraded in accordance with NFPA 1912 and, and so forth and, and so on there, incorporate many features as possible. So their NFPA 1911 stating 15 years uh, for, for, for frontline trucks and then any apparatus. So then the next question that came out of the customer's mouth was, okay, well, if they're in reserve status, how long can I keep them in reserve status? And so if they were not manufactured to the applicable NFPA fire apparatus standard with that, which is 1912, 
okay? Um, or they're over 25 years old, they should be replaced and restored like Chief Brunacini's Mac 1 there, Engine 1, uh, his 1952 Mac. So again, I figured I'd pass on that little tidbit of knowledge and I know our department agencies, you're probably rolling your eyes like, oh, we've got trucks older than that and we know budgets don't always allow for the replacement of vehicles as quickly as we would like, but it is, it is a standard. And like many NFPA standards, there's something that we all strive for. NFPA 1710, there's not many, if any, departments that adhere to it 100%. Keep in mind, these standards are things to strive for as much as possible. And the bottom line is most of these standards are designed um, to keep your crews safe and to ensure that they have a long, healthy career and a safe and healthy retirement as well. All right. Let's jump right into it and keep in mind, I'll be here for questions as well. Um, those of you that have participated with me in the past, you know that I like to stay on until the end and, and make sure we answer um, all the questions as best as possible. Anything that requires additional research, I'll simply follow up with you via email. All right. We're gonna jump right into the system here. And the lay of the land for today, again, kind of keeping NFPA 1911 in the back of your mind as the standard that we want to follow for checking vehicles, managing your fleet, testing vehicles. That's their website, and this is where you can view those documents. Excellent, excellent reference, and you can see the table of contents here. 26 chapters, so it's a lot for sure, but depending on the vehicle you have and the area of responsibility that you have, you can focus in on the various chapters. Okay. So what I want to cover and in, in how our system helps you adhere to 1911 and better manage your fleet, um, we're going to jump from first into the admin module. Okay, and within this admin module, we've got our apparatus list. Now, those of you that are new or thinking of coming over, we can import your apparatus into the system. Okay, so in, in lieu of manually inputting each one of these apparatus separately, we can bring them in, in a batch. We can also update if we need to via a batch as well. Let's take a look at engine one. So in an engine one, we've got these fields. And if you're an EMS customer also, you will have some required fields for Nemesis 3 and or Nemesis 2, depending on which Nemesis you're following, uh, standard you're following and that's for um, documenting patient care. If you don't have our EPCR product, these fields won't appear and you won't have to fill them in. But as a lay of the land here, what I want to show you is that you've got an apparatus ID. This is the call sign. When you see these little question pop callouts here, you can click on it and it will give you a little summary of what that field is all about. This is the field that is sent to Enfers. This is how you document your incidents and which units respond by their call sign. Enfers does not care which physical vehicle went to the scene. They just care the name of the vehicle, okay, the call sign. So we know we do switch outs. And so engine one today, it could be in its frontline truck, but tomorrow it has to go in for a PM, preventative maintenance, and you're going to be switching out you don't really need to go in and mess with anything here in the administration module to do that. And I'll show you that uh, momentarily. This is limited to five characters per Enfers. Some agencies like to spell out engine one. So we give you that field to put in a unique apparatus name and then another field for its call sign if indeed it's ever different. Then you've got the Enfers apparatus type of required field. That's how we organize apparatus um, in our system. So you've got ground fire suppression and it's broken down to the other categories that are in Enfers. And you'll see when we go into the uh, apparatus portion of our uh, maintenance module, you'll see how um, it's all organized and managed. A Couple other fields I like to point out here, the vehicle number. So this is, again, with the call out here, it's a unique permanent asset tracking number. This is your fleet ID. So last four, the VIN, government vehicle number, however you track it as an asset, not as a call sign for response, but as an asset. That number from the time you take delivery of it to the time you dispose of it will be the same. 
and it ties into our system to allow you, regardless of what this becomes, you'll have an entire set of its repairs, checks, and everything, again, from the time, the first truck check you ever do on it to the last one, from the first PM to the last transmission replacement. All of that can be tracked by this vehicle number. Then what I recommend to our customers is that we also fill in as many of these other fields as possible. Are they critical? No, but there is a summary report in our system that includes these fields and it gives you a very quick single page, well, depending on the, the size of your fleet, could be multiple pages for sure, um, but it gives you a nice um, landscape oriented um, at a glance look at your entire fleet with many of these columns in that particular report. You'll assign it to a station, manufacturer, year of manufacturer, model, engine, and so forth, descriptive elements of the vehicle. But the other ones I'd like to point out are these. The initial vehicle cost, if you, if you can put that in there, or at least get it as close as possible to what you know that vehicle initially cost, along with the date you placed it in service and when you expect, expect to replace it. So if this were $250,000 when I purchased it, we placed it in service January 1st, 2010, and I expect to replace it again per NFPA, uh, per NFPA 1911. Let's say it's got a useful life to 2035. So we'll go the first 15 in service and then the next 10 as a reserve truck. It is currently in service. And this NFPA compliance required, this correlates to both NFPA 1500 and 1911. By checking this, this particular apparatus will feed our safety analytics gauge. And I'll show you that um, time permitting today. The frequency of inspection is daily, or it can be weekly, monthly, or annual, depending on the vehicle and your organization. And then the apparatus ownership, this is an important field. If it's your truck, in other words, it's part of your fleet, you'll, you'll select this radio button. If, like many organizations, okay, if, like many organizations, uh, you rely on neighboring agencies to enhance your response to ensure you have the right number of apparatus and personnel on the scene for standards of cover, or for your and for your effective response force, you can actually add non-agency vehicles to this, and you'll just put in the bare minimum fields, all the required fields. You won't know necessarily all the other details, nor do you need to. But what this enables is your ability to buy apparatus ID and via a CAD link that those apparatus can populate the incident as well as your own apparatus. Um, but by selecting not department unit, you don't manage this, so it will not appear in your maintenance module at all. So keep that in mind if you have a CAD interface or you need to document other units that respond. Now, you can still do some of this via aid given and aid received, but by having it part of your incident report with their apparatus, it will allow, it will the system will treat it like it's your personnel and your, your, your units when you run reports on effective response force, the number of people on the scene, number of units on the scene, and type of units on the scene. You can upload a picture and then add notes if necessary. So any questions on what you're seeing here? This is the foundation for managing your fleet and following the guidelines in NFPA 1911. We have two questions, one from John. How do we replace an apparatus using the same apparatus number? And so if I understand correctly, John, it's gonna be engine one is now being retired and you have a new engine one, but essentially it's a whole new vehicle number. Um, I can show you that later, but it's just a matter of archiving the existing apparatus, and I'll show you where you do that, and adding a brand new engine one, still the same call sign because you'll be archiving the existing one. You can also put an, an X on it um, if you wish to, but it's not critical. And then of course the vehicle number will become, will be different altogether. And then Brad is asking, can the vehicle number be changed if editing to match with the mechanic department? Absolutely, okay. And so keep in mind that 
this vehicle number. Now here's the key. So within the database, there's this is a, this is an assigned vehicle. In a drop-down list for running reports, it's going to show triple nine. But if for some reason this needs to be that, okay, the drop-down will now show triple nine zero. But all of the historical maintenance records will still be attached to that vehicle and will still show no problem. The problem occurs is if you start adding the same apparatus with uh, another apparatus with the same vehicle numbers, that's when we start getting issues. But uh, appending this or changing this on the same vehicle and then clicking save will be fine. All right, hope that answers your questions there, uh, John and Brad. If not, just uh, if you need this, uh, further clarification, um, let me know. Um, Craig is asking, your screen layout is different than mine. Is that a new version or an update? So do you mean this page right here? And I'm zoomed in, and these tabs are because I'm, I have an EPCR. I have a NEMS, this has a Nemesis 3 attached to it, so that's why I've got these additional tabs. These are Nemesis 3 elements, as are some of these fields. So it's going to look a little bit different than yours if you're fire only. OK, so next up, we want to go into the maintenance module. You're welcome, Craig. Uh, and then the maintenance module. Okay, so we're gonna go visit our rig checks here in a little bit, but what I wanna show you is we're gonna focus not on equipment. And when you go, when you land on this page, for those of you new to ER or are seeking to join us, it's gonna go, it's gonna land on the last grid that you visited. So I was just visiting the equipment grid. I want the apparatus grid for today's discussion. Okay, and so remember I said that the grid is organized by Enfer's in apparatus type. Okay, so all of my apparatus is categorized by these codes. These are not call signs. These are the Enfer's codes um, for apparatus type. If I expand this grid, and this grid is a tr three, three, not tree, not tree tier, three tier uh, layout. And so we've got the primary tier is your category so ground fire suppression other the next tier is the apparatus these three okay or i should say four apparatus and then the third tier would be any pending maintenance for that piece of equipment so for example engine one has a major repair transmission won't shift out of first gear so that truck should have been taken out of service all right, I put it back in service when I was just visiting the administration module. It was out of service due to this repair. If a vehicle is out of service and maintaining it and you want to track its out of service status, it'll go red with the red warning triangle. Now the category is collapsed. This is just letting me know that I have at least one engine that is out of service. And in this case, I have engine three that's out of service. All my other vehicles' engines are in service. Okay. Going across here, we've got all of these columns that can sort and or filter by any of these items. So for example, if I know the vehicle ID, and be smarter than me, pick the right field. That, so the vehicle number is, remember we changed it to 9990, and if, what we will most typically do is go right here. Now keep in mind, here's the, here's the key that we always get questions on. If I'm switched out, and this always becomes a bit of a pain point, if I'm switched out and I have a maintenance issue, search by vehicle number. What, because what will happen is if you start go going and changing the apparatus ID all the time, whenever you do a switch out, it's gonna cause a lot of problems and invariably you're going to forget that you switched out. So on this grid, when doing a maintenance request, you're probably going to be right, but just put in the vehicle number to make sure you're actually looking at the correct physical vehicle that you're requesting maintenance on. Call sign, apparatus ID, physical truck, vehicle number. If you remember that, you'll save headaches down the road for sure. Okay, so we're going to focus on engine one, and we've got the vehicle apparatus ID, the vehicle number, station, any pending maintenance, 
and I can even filter. I just want to see all major repairs if I wanted to. And of course, that is a major repair. Who it's assigned to. Who knew we were working on trucks now? And then the scheduled date. The reason this is red, and, you're, and you probably already have figured this out, it's past due. If I wish to, and, some, and this is a good practice, if this needs to go into the shop, just go ahead and print out the work order and tape it to the windshield. And if you've taken any photos of it, that'll also, the thumbnails of the photos will appear here also. So you can simply print this, tape it to the windshield, the dash, and of course, the smart money will be what I'm gonna show you next too, but this will supplement an email that the fleet manager may have received. And that way, whoever works on the truck, they don't have to log into their account to see what needs to get taken care of. I can edit that action. So one thing we won't have time to dive into today is the administrative setting for roles and permissions. But suffice it to say that if I'm an engineer, I could have at the very least the permissions to request maintenance. So the workflow is such. Request the date and time, you click now. Who requested it? That'll autofill by whoever's logged in. The type of repair. And the question we often get, um, these are hard coded um, into the system. Sometimes people ask who um, can we add to this and currently we cannot. The description of what needs to get worked on. Any other elements of data that you wish to put in here, whether it's in or out of service, and I am taking it out of service because if it doesn't go out of first gear, it's not gonna get me too far. I can upload a video or, or a image here or a document if I wish to. And then I can, now this is the stage where maybe I'm not, I don't have the permissions to assign and schedule. I would then click request and close and an email pop-up would appear. But let's say I do have the permissions to assign and schedule. I scroll down, I'm gonna assign it to a vendor or personnel in my organization. The vendor list is here. If you have administrative privileges, you'll be able to edit it. If not, um, it'll just have this drop down, and you will pick the correct vendor. If the, uh, if the time it was assigned and scheduled, the apparatus hours and miles have changed, you can, you can enter the new uh, data points there still out of service, any additional notes. And then at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and assign schedule and close. And it, my email notification pop-up appears, I can send an email to whomever I wish to. Okay, so Dave's in charge of our fleet. I can send it to him. Now here's another trick that our, my department did and others do. Instead of making it just one person, now of course I can send it to multiple recipients and so forth. You don't have to limit it to just one, but what our department did was the person, the, the BC that was in charge of fleet, what if he's on vacation? Someone else has to pick it up. We created a um, alias account that would be uh, sent to anybody who is attached to that account. So in other words, we had fleet at gvfire.org. And if you were added to the recipient list for that alias account, anybody who would send it to fleet, uh, an email to fleet at, would get that email. So it can be distributed to multiple people. So certainly the primary person assigned to it gets it. And then anybody else that's on that list of receiving that email, uh, that email name will get that email as well. And that can be set up by your IT person in the department, whoever's managing your email server. Piece of cake and it really works well. All right, so we'll send it to me because I don't wanna bug Dave today. The message will appear in the email as well. I'll go ahead and send that, and then we're set. I'm gonna take the time here to answer a couple quick questions. Um, vehicle ID dis dis still does not print on the work order. This is from Chris. Um, yep, this is critical as you pointed out so we can coordinate the correct vehicle with the fleet services. So what Chris is saying is we need to get not just the the vehicle ID to print out. Yes, it's a bug. Good catch, Chris. If you submitted it, good job. So what Chris is saying is this field on the work order is missing. The number is not missing, right? Because it's right, it's right here, and it is part of that that record. So I 
I will make a note. Chris, do me a favor. Just send me an email, Tom at emergency reporting. Okay, you've submitted it. Okay, um, I'll check into it. I don't know its status, but great, great point. So thank you for that. Excellent. Byron, hey, good to have you and congratulations on winning our backpack at FRI. Um, Byron's one of our new customers um, down in the deep south, some of the nicest people on the planet for sure. Um, and this should answer your question. His was, um, why doesn't the last five of the VIN, which is their vehicle ID number, show on the work order? And that is currently a bug, as Chris pointed out. So um, I will check on that. Um, Chris, if you want to, just shoot me a quick email, tom at emergencyreporting.com, to say, hey, what's the deal on this? And I'll, I'll check on the, the bug ticket status for you, and I'll respond back to you today. Just that's tom, T-O-M, at emergencyreporting.com. John, John, you're welcome on printing the work order, you bet. Um, uh, let's see, you guys are killing it today, great questions. All right, so uh, Chris is adding another ghost personnel, doesn't that show up in other reports and throw them off? Um, I don't think so, I'll show you how that works out um, if we have time, since it's kind of, it's more on incidents than it is on fleet, Chris. So um, if we have time, I'll go over it, otherwise maybe we can connect offline. Uh, is there a way to report, and this is from Brian, is there a way to or report to see all repair requests for the entire fleet? So do you mean pending maintenance or history of all of the all of the repairs? So things that still need to get done, Brian, or things that have already been done or both? And while he's typing that, let's press on. And we're halfway through. Great questions so far, need to be done, so pending. Okay, yeah, I'll show you that. Um, because that's part of what we'll wrap up today with our, our, our reports, because putting all of this great data in, you got to get it out to make it useful, to tell your story, to, to, to drive budgets, and to see which pieces of equipment are causing you the most headaches, even though you probably know that. Okay, so that's a pending maintenance. The email that comes over looks like this. I'll pop open my email client real quick and uh, show you what that looks like. And then we'll take a couple, we'll take a peek at some other things here real quick. Okay. So major repair trans won't shift out of first gear, and this was sent on such and such a date and time. And this could go to any recipients that you wish. And of course, you can add additional notes in there based on uh, the lap before you send it out. You saw that earlier. Okay, I'm gonna close out that so we don't get interrupted with emails. All right, up here, the next line up. So that's a pending maintenance item. The vehicle should be out of service. Let me do that real quick. And it'll go red on me. I can send an email, same process. Okay, so a couple other items you need to know about for managing your fleet here. This one is if you're gonna add a maintenance request. The one we just did was editing an existing one. This will show you the entire history of that vehicle from the time you took delivery of it, hopefully, to, to current time, to present time. And keep in mind, and God forbid, something happens where someone's injured, okay, um, or worse. And OSHA comes in, NIOSH comes in, and they want a full investigation. They're gonna ask for your, your entire maintenance records for that piece of equipment top to bottom, start to finish. Now, if you're like my department, we had a pretty significant incident that took place with a, an aerial device. We were doing it on paper, coffee stains, grease stains, missing fields, missing days even, doesn't look well for us. If you have it done electronically, you can not only check to see that things were get done, but I'll show you in our daily log where you can confirm because when you complete a rig check, it automatically populates in the daily log. It will automatically appear here. And then when you run a report for this apparatus, you won't deliver the report to an investigation from here. This is a summary. Um, we have a report in the system that if they ask for it, you got three or four clicks, type in the apparatus name, and you get you can deliver the entire report to whoever is asking for it on everything that was done to that vehicle. Oh yeah, brakes, yep, we fixed those two weeks ago. PMs, yep, the guys have been doing those religiously. And by the way, look at our daily checks. We haven't missed a single day. That's the kind of quality you're hoping to get. 
and that's something that our system enables. I'm going to take a pause, more questions. Um, Brian, I'll show you that need to be done here shortly on a report. Um, pre recurring preventative maintenance. So it doesn't, what Mike's asking is based on like miles entered, will it automatically pop up saying, okay, you've got a PM due in, in 100 miles or the time period. It doesn't, you have to schedule those, those maintenance by adding a maintenance request. So for example, on that, so I can say these are on the same schedule. I can add a maintenance record. This is a bulk operation where I've checked two apparatus and I can schedule maintenance type, routine inspection, Q4, PM. Okay, now because of my permissions, we're gonna go in and I'm going to schedule it, not for now, but for needs to be completed no later than, give us a buffer time, November 30th. Okay, the vendor, I'll just put me in there for right now, but I could select a vendor. And now I'm scheduling it. Sign, schedule, and close. And now you can see we have a routine inspection scheduled and you would repeat that process for subsequent preventative maintenances. And when you run a report, um, it, will, it will show you what's still pending for routine um, and I selected inspection, it should have been routine maintenance, my apologies. And uh, and so it will show you uh, that on a report and then on the welcome page, while we don't have granular filters for pending maintenance, you still have the ability to show that on the welcome page and it, you can show details or summary. And if you show details, you can click through to that particular work order. We need filters for sure here, but it does work well. And then of course the report that I'll show for Brian here in a little bit as we wrap up at the end here, we'll, uh, we'll better uh, uh, display that and, and, and show you how to, uh, to get, a, uh, not alerts, but notifications on it. Okie doke, let's go back to maintenance. Okay, we're focusing on the engines, all right. And then once something is completed, so let's go to this one that we finally fixed the transmission. I'm gonna click on complete, whoever does the, the final work on it. Completed by, hours if it change changes. So we had, and miles. Again, it's not a fuel entry, back in service past labor hours was say 10 parts labor I have, i'm just putting in some number of shop supplies any additional notes any the invoice perhaps or the test the work order that that shows uh, everything was tested and passed complete and close send an email again just like i did before i'll choose not to this time and now we're back in service, that pending maintenance item goes away. So that's the lay of the land and the workflow here. The last thing I need to show you is depending on your permissions, you'll have the ability to either edit that equipment, that piece of uh, uh, apparatus, and it takes you to the admin module. Most people in your organization will not have this. It'll just be an I for info. And then likewise here, if I am taking this vehicle out of service and replacing it with a new one, I simply archive this. So this goes back to the question that um, John had. You just go ahead and archive this piece of equipment. All of its vehicle history is maintained, but it is now off the list and your active fleet and you can add a new engine one. But don't worry, engine one is still here. We did this with the next E1 before. And it's like, oops, I didn't mean to archive it. Not a problem, just unarchive it and you're good to go. Okay, so the next part of what we need to do is our new rig checks. So the day-to-day -day management of our, of our fleet, the, a key element of NFPA 1911, okay? 
So those of you that have emergency reporting, you can click try it now up at the top here for the new rig checks. And then once you do, you'll have this button that appears here. Okay. And this is our new rig check. Now, we don't have time today, but I was doing this yesterday on my phone. It's, it's what we call a um, responsive design, which means that if you're on a tablet or mobile device, it will scale to the device that you're on and be usable on that device very easily. Quick lay of the land, I can filter by name, ID, station, or vehicle number here. So again, the vehicle number is crucial. Teach your guys, okay, to look here when they're checking a vehicle, especially if they are in a switch out, okay? So right now I am showing just one station, the one I'm assigned to. I'm gonna check all. I apply filters to show in and out of service vehicles. I could show just those assigned to my station, but I wanna see everything for today's purposes. So when I'm going to check a vehicle, all right, and I know I'm in a switch out, exercise caution. If engine one is running, let, let me rephrase that. If this vehicle number is now running as engine one, all right, and their call sign is engine one. And the good thing is the guys know this. They'll know to check that it's normally engine four as a reserve truck. But I'm gonna go ahead and start my check for this vehicle. All right, so keep that in mind. Look here first, start your check. And the workflow looks like this. Now I had started one yesterday and it's asking me, um, or someone else, excuse me, has started one. If I start a new one, it will delete the existing one. So that's fine, I'm gonna start a new one. And so the workflow is linear top to bottom from the form that you've created. And I'll show you how to create a form here momentarily. Put in an odometer reading, engine hours. I go through, pass, pass. If something has failed, Okay, and we'll start a shift war. And uh, I can click F file, I can take a picture, upload a video if I need to. All right, then we'll move on to the next compartment. Now again, this is a much abbreviated um, checklist for demonstration purposes. But again, I've got that. And then when I'm done, I simply click Submit. It lets me know my rig check was submitted successfully. And to confirm, again, shop number 9990, view, view history, it will take me back to the maintenance. And you can see I've, I use this form, the routine inspection, who did it, one failed question, or if there were more, it would show that. I click edit. If I need to print this out or save it as a PDF elsewhere, it's already saved. Um, it's actually attached as an HTML file, but I can print it as a PDF if I needed to. I click here, and this is my what I call my printable view. Okay. Okay. Go back here. Cancel that. Head back to rig checks. All right, so the forms, here's what it looks like. You'll uh, click on the edit icon back at the apparatus. This is the form. So I want to rename that form. I can edit it. Descri change the description if I need to. These are the fields. You can enable a bulk pass, but be careful of keyboard or, uh, I guess now no more no more pencil whipping, right? It's keyboard or tap uh, finger finger whipping on the uh, on the tablets. So you can bulk complete a section. Photos of the compartment, if you wish to add a photo. The the title, the description. 
Okay, and then we're on to the next compartment and you can keep adding questions as you see fit and compartments. Okay, once we're done, we've got that. Then I can delete it, but we've got a new process for deleting, which I think is terrific. You've got to type in the name of the form to delete it forever and it's nice and clearly stated. Well done by our UI team. And then we've got this. I want that same form assigned to engine four. Select it, duplicate and assign, and now that form is ready to rock for engine four. If I need to make changes because engine four has a specialized piece of equipment, not a problem. I just go down to that compartment and add some new questions. Right here. When I'm ready to go, I click publish, and now this form is ready to use for engine four as well. So try it out on your phones, guys. It works really well. Um, and we wanna hear your feedback on it because it's a, we're pretty excited about this new rig check um, element uh, for managing your fleet. And uh, we look forward, this is our first iteration of it. And so there'll be more to come in, in the months ahead. I'm gonna take a pause to answer some uh, questions that have come up here. Uh, let's see, can you, so we did the, uh, Mike, I hope I answered your question okay on the recurring preventative maintenance. Um, is there an update as to when the work order will be a PDF attachment to the email? Um, Brad, good question. I'd have to check with the product owner on that. So what Brad's asking guys is uh, when you send that email back on when we request the work order, that there's an, a PDF attachment also, kind of like what we print, you know, to tape to the windshield or to send off with the, with the, with the vehicle, um, having that attached to the email being sent, which is a wonderful idea. I would have to check with the uh, the product owner on that for you, Brad. I don't know the answer to that. Um, Craig, can I bring in previous maintenance records from the software we are switching from to ER? Unfortunately not. However, what you could do is I would check into um, what kind of reports that the, your, your previous system had, and that's where we're gonna go to next is our reports as we wrap up the session today. But in you, your old RMS, chances are, hopefully, there are some somewhat decent reports from which you can basically do this, Craig, is run a report for all of the maintenance history for say engine one, and then attach that. So the way that would work is attach that report as a, as a single work item. So what would be what would happen here is we would do this for whoops engine one. I'm gonna go ahead and we'll go straight to complete. I'm gonna call this other. We're gonna call this 2000 and say 17 to 2019 maintenance history. All right, I can put in the last apparatus hours and miles from the last maintenance item from my old RMS, trucks and service, pass, we don't need any of this, notes, um, file attached from old RMS to include maintenance history, learn to type, attach that file, complete and close, and I'm not gonna send an email, but now on that vehicle's history, oh, that's not the button, that's the button. I'll have it as part of the records with an emergency reporting. Granted, you won't be able to run reports in our system on it per se, but at least that entire vehicle history will be available to you in one system. Um, can you import any list for rig checks? Now, those forms, uh, David, the forms have to be uh, created manually, but once one, at least one is created, they can be shared with any other apparatus in your in your fleet list. Good question. Byron, can you quickly show us where to give our guys access to rig checks? Yeah, I can do that. Um, we've got time. Um, I'll go there momentarily. Um, Byron, stand by. Um, does, rig, does rig check drop in the maintenance history? Absolutely, it does right here. So all these where you see the word test, that's the name of the form that I used. Um, that's where we were practicing rig checks. 
And the one other thing that I didn't show you that you guys got to see, and this is great for chief officers, right? So here on the daily log, we have six things that now populate in our daily log. There's a direct check I just did. And there's, so what's nice is the rig check is its own unique activity code and auto populates based on that unique code. The two maintenance items I just completed also populated here, but they're under completed maintenance. So those things that you, these things you do automatically are gonna be here. So if you know you've got three trucks at your station and you go look and there's only two entries, okay, where's medic one? Why didn't they get their drug check done today? It should populate here, okay? So, oh, I love Brad's next question, all right. Um, so Brent, I hope that answered your question. Is there a direct link to ER rig similar to fuel ER? Great question. There is not a standalone progressive web app for um, rig checks like there is for fuel ER, but, and I can't show it to you right now because I'm hard connected and not Wi-Fi, and I don't want to eat up the time connecting because then it'll give a pause in the audio and all that stuff. But what you want to do is on your phone, create a shortcut to that website, what I mean shortcut is that we're going to go here. So guys, follow along with me. This is what you want to do. This is what I did on my phone. Go to rig checks on your phone. Log into ER. Go to rig checks. Then there's a way to save it to your, um, they call it, Apple calls it, um, add the home screen. And it'll save it. It'll look like an app icon. But then when you tap on it, it automatically goes to this page. Now, if you're not logged in, it will prompt you to log into ER, but as soon as you log in, you get this page immediately. So it's like a web app. Um, you know, it's like an app. I shouldn't even say web app. It's like an app. It's just, you've got to do that initial login and then you're you're ready to do rig checks. That's what you want to teach your driver operators and engineers to do from their phones. Um, Craig, and you can add any file you want there basically up to about 25 megabytes in size. So when he says adding files, both in rig checks and in the maintenance request, as long as it doesn't exceed a certain file size, give or take 25 megs, you'll be good to go. Okay, I'm gonna pause um, on questions um, and I wanna go and look at two other things before we go into different reports in the system. Guys, I really appreciate the awesome questions today. Okay. So admin settings, there's two key admin settings we wanna talk about. The first one is for Byron, and he's talking about security roles and permissions. Okay, so this is for administrators. I'm gonna edit this role and permissions. And if you're not an administrator, don't worry about this. Your admin will know um, what to do here, but we're gonna look at just the maintenance module, okay? And in order to be able to perform a rig check, okay, So if I want to perform a rig check, you'll notice that I have to be able to request maintenance, complete maintenance, and assign and schedule maintenance. It's how the system's designed and be able to view maintenance history. It's just the way everything talks and connects to different tables and everything connected to each other within the system. So if, if I'm a firefighter or an engineer, let's rephrase that. If I'm a, an engineer and I'm required to do a rig check, I'm responsible for that rig check. What you see here, are the minimum settings that they need to have in order to perform a rig check. The good thing is, if they had no access to begin with, okay, it's, a, it's subtractive. So if I start taking, whoops, if I start taking away things, the system lets you know, let me just show you here. So if I've taken away a lot of stuff, but I wanna make sure that they are able to perform a rig check, the dependencies update, and so I can click once, and now this person can perform a rig check successfully in our system. That's item number one. So Byron, I hope that answered, uh, answered your question on the um, giving access to rig checks. Anybody who needs to do rig checks, this is what their maintenance module should look like. Excuse me, their maintenance module permission settings should look like. So this is an administrator, we'll give them full access. The other key element, because guaranteed you'll run into this, in admin, your 
default activity codes is paramount to ensuring that when you complete a rig check, it auto populates in the daily log. If this is blank, and most of you, it will be blank because this is a brand new feature, you will then want to go in to your daily log activity code list, add a new activity code called rig check, rig check completed, whatever you like, save it, go back to default activity codes and assign that activity code to a completed rig check. If any of these are blank, Whenever you complete an item, it will not automatically populate with the ex exception of incidents. It'll still populate, but it won't show an activity code. But for rig checks, events, and maintenance, if you don't have these selected, they will not auto-populate in your daily log. All right, a couple more questions from uh, David. Under admin, can you import missing information and merge to current records. Yes, as long as the vehicle ID number is the same, it will update that vehicle ID, you know, that vehicle information. So if you were to import data here, and again, that has to be sent through our, our implementation team to import, but I, I assume that's what you mean, David. Um, now, if you mean missing information um, for uh, like maintenance history, uh, no. Um, just you have to go through the process that I had showed uh, showed you earlier in response to um, to who was it um, to Craig, and so um, but this can be imported because it'll look at the apparatus ID and the vehicle number and will append this list if necessary on an import. But that import has to be done by our team. Can you add the rig check button to the main home screen? That is an awesome idea. So what Matt's saying is, can I just put a button up here, like rig check, start rig check, and it, or just go to rig check instead of going click once, click twice. So your smart money would be this. And again, I'm in Safari, it's all gonna be different. So even if we don't do that request, add the bookmark, okay? And then on your bookmarks, every browser is different. I now have rig checks. So on my browser, I just click once, and it takes me to that page. Now, again, if I'm not logged into ER, I've got to log in, but instead of having to navigate through multiple pages, it will take me, once I'm logged in, directly to this page. So even if there's not a button on the home page, like you're saying, Matt, you want to bookmark it, add teacher guys to bookmark it, one click, log in, and they're right at, they're right at rig checks, not at incidents, excuse me. Okay, so here's what, we, here's what we got. We got like five minutes. I want to make sure we look at a couple reports um, before we uh, wrap up for the day, and then I'll be able to answer some more questions. So reports. Quick way to get reports. We're going to go to not reports. We're going to go to maintenance. We're going to click on reports, the button up at the button bar, horizontal button bar here. And here are some killer reports. Budgeting purposes, going to hit that one first, okay? Apparatus re replacement year by Enfra's apparatus type. Take a look at that. So I want to see everything I'm going to have to replace in 2030. Chief needs a preliminary budget. Okay, now granted, you will probably want to, let's just cover a wide span of years because demo accounts are messy. There we go. Chief will want to probably have some inflation um, from when you actually purchased it. So that's not a hard thing to do to take it to Excel and then put a percentage increase on that. But you can see over the course of multiple years what I need to be replacing. And then there's, a, there's engine 71 that's due to be replaced. It's gonna cost, a, it cost us 465,000, which means it's probably double by now. That's one report. And again, I'm just looking at a couple couple high level reports here for all of you. Fuel usage. So we, di we didn't even get to go into Fuel ER, but that's um, a web app. Um, doesn't You don't install it, you just go to a URL and it's a single purpose app for documenting fuel consumption. So if I wanna just see my total fuel consumption for 2019, I've got this report. My hours, miles, fuel volume, if it's a diesel, the diesel exhaust fuel, uh, flu fluid, the cost, and any other notes here. 
Okay, and again, I can see here, apparatus ID, I can go by all engine one. So every time it was an engine one, or better, the smart money is right here. I just want a certain vehicle. I want 9990. Anytime that vehicle was fueled, we'll show here. So how much are we spending on engine one for fuel? Or better still, shop number 9990. So another one that you've got to see is rig checks for the year. We'll just look at all apparatus. Again, I'm kind of flying through this to wrap up because we're at the top of the hour here. I know you guys got busy thing, things to do to keep busy today. Vehicle number, passed, failed. Failed means at least one item was a failed item. Passed means it was 100% pass, and, and you've got a summary report there. Last one I want to show you. Well, there's two. I, I lied. There's two. Report 1700. I want to see which we know in our gut which trucks are, are really our pain in the butt trucks. This will actually tell you that engine one was out of service. And I took it, remember, I took it temporarily out of service, so it showed 10 minutes. It was out for 336 hours earlier this year and for a total of 14 days and 13 minutes. So you'll be able to see your vehicle and its out of service status. Last one. Okay, apparatus maintenance history. I wanna see, actually I wanna see basically from the time we took delivery of this vehicle, this is the, the dreaded, you had an incident with your truck and someone's asked for all of the records for that vehicle. And there it is, what you spent on it, what it was. And again, I did all maintenance, maintenance types but that is basically a report version of what you saw in the apparatus history back in the apparatus grid. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Um, I wanna address any questions that are outstanding. Um, and before I do that, I just wanna thank everybody for attending today. Um, it was a very productive hour. Um, thank you for all the great questions. Uh, next week's um, boot camp will be at the same time. And I gotta double check the topic, but um, please register for that. Um, you can do that straight from our welcome page. In fact, let's just go there so I can show you how to do that. So here on the welcome page on the carousel, did they change it? So you can register for the fleet one, which you did today, but let's just do this, resources. We're gonna to go to webinars, educational webinars. And our next one's next week is going to be on training records that rock. All right, so if you guys have got to go, I completely understand. I'm gonna answer a couple questions and we'll call it a day. We'll catch you next week. Thanks everybody. All right, Chris is asking, assigning and scheduling maintenance should not be a permission for most line staff. That needs to be fixed so it is not required just to complete rig checks. Yeah, good point, Chris. The thing with that is that it's the way the databases work with each other that if we were to take away any part of it, it would preclude the ability to complete a rig check because rig check is tied into essentially kind of completing a maintenance. But definitely put that in your feedback um, where you can submit feedback on on rig checks so that our product owner sees that. And then Sean's asking, uh, shouldn't all the maintenance report offer reports offer apparatus number instead of name? I would argue yes, Sean, I think you're correct. Some of the reports we have are legacy reports, so the newer reports should all have it. Uh, and if they don't, um, I would recommend, I agree with that recommendation that having it by vehicle number as the default, um, is, is an important way to do it. Now, the key is as long as they're that they're documenting the, the fleet correct, the 
can I talk today? I don't think so. Can, uh, as long as they're documenting that maintenance item with the correct vehicle number, um, there'll still be a way to pull it out um, effectively and to make sure it's tied to the correct apparatus. Um, will this webinar be available to view by other members of the department at a later date? Absolutely, Brian. And it's so easy that um, all you need to do is go to our YouTube channel. You'll do a search for emergency reporting. Now I'm logged in, but the last two recordings are here week two, and then week one, PPE management. And, and so later today, I'll have this one up, up and viewable by anybody in the department. Yep, that last report, Sean, you're right. It, it showed um, apparatus ID, not vehicle number. Good catch. All right, everybody. Um, again, thank you so much um, for being here today. Have a good week, um, good upcoming weekend, and I hope to see you again uh, next Thursday. Take care, everybody.